Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Biohacking Beauty Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so happy that you are with us today. Uh, my guest today is a very good friend and an incredible person uh, named Dr. Molly Malouf. Um, she has firsthand experience in transforming her health and the health of her patients. And she has dedicated her career to researching new innovative uh, ways to help people live a healthier life, lifestyle and improve their health span. Uh, for three years, she has taught a course on health span at Stanford University. She is on the cutting edge of personalized medicine, changing how we, we look at everything from digital health technologies to psychedelic medicine and has high profile entrepreneurs, investors, and technology executives on optimizing. Uh, she's helped them uh, optimize their health. Uh, through her new book that is coming out, The Spark Factor, she focuses uh, her unique philosophy uh, to help women biohack their biology to live a happier, healthier, and more energized life. And people that I trust personally in this space really has called it a biohacking Bible. So I'm super excited uh, reading this book that's coming out the, at the end of January 2023, at the end of this month. Uh, today, we're going to dive deep into, let's say, biohacking and health optimization as a whole. We're going to look at personalized nutrition, uh, microbiome, and optimizing gut health. Uh, we're going to be looking at metabolic flexibility and fasting, hormonal health, and also cutting edge biohacking strategies. We're gonna obviously look at how we improve our skin through each, in each one of these modalities. Uh, you will learn how to or what tests are important to do on a regular basis and uh, how you can, who you can go to in order to interpret those tests. You'll learn what, um, what is metabolic flexibility and how you can measure it and control it and you learn what is what is the cutting edge what is the next best thing as far as women's health health optimization and biohacking uh, before we dive into today's episode i'd uh, like to mention that it's going to mean the world to us if you took two seconds out of your day to subscribe to the podcast not only uh, will this ensure you will never miss on an episode but it also greatly helps the growth of the podcast. Um, so please make sure you do that. And last but not least, I'd like to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Young Goose, the biohacking skincare brand. And what we do at Young Goose is we take the cutting edge as far as longevity molecules and we lower the functional age of your skin. After that, we ask the skin to do specific things that it can now do better, whether it is wrinkles, pigmentation, laxity, uh, sensitivity, acne, and overall age of our skin. So make sure you head to younggoose.com, uh, take our skin quiz, and find a system that is right for you. Uh, but now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Molly Malouf. All right. So Molly, welcome to the Biohacking Beauty Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm very excited. Obviously, we, we love you here on a personal level. We love the work that you do. We consume every bit of, of information you put out there. Um, oh, so I'm, I'm super excited uh, to, uh, to read the new book that is coming out soon. Yeah. How are you feeling about it? Amazing. Um, I'm feeling really good about it. I mean, it's definitely one of those things where it's been three years in the making of this project mm -hmm. and it's like, it's books are, I mean, I've never done a book before and I've always wanted to. And so I didn't realize what kind of learning curve would, it would be, but it's definitely, um, it was definitely a really great learning experience. Like I learned so much and I feel like the next book I write will be a lot easier. Yeah. A lot easier to do, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's like one thing is there's one thing to write a book. And there's another thing to market a book. Mm -hmm. And so marketing the book is a little stressful. For sure. But, um, you know, I spent so many years building relationships with brands and companies and people and influencers and podcasts. And so it's kind of like, it's fun to get to um, 
after like helping so many companies, it's it's fun to ask them to help me too. So that's been really nice, including your company. Exactly. So. Yeah, that's why I wanted to say that you've helped us a lot, and we super appreciate it. And obviously, um, uh, we rely on on people such as yourself to like our products. So it's very exciting for for us to kind of be talking about your baby and and what you're doing. And um, so, what are just looking at the book and and for um, anyone such as myself that is like super excited to read it already uh what what are some of the main themes and ideas that that you present there uh in spark well, factor I, would say, which is the book? i mean the big big thing about the book that a lot of people don't really realize is mitochondria are the seat of health and disease so the vast majority of chronic metabolic diseases and mental illnesses are due to mitochondrial dysfunction and energy deficiency. Yeah. Because when we have energy deficiency in our cells, what happens is the cells will break down and sometimes they'll die. Mm-hmm. And even if they just break down, if you don't have enough energy to do work, it's kind of like having a house that had the power cut or 50, or maybe it's running on 50% power, like in a brownout. Mm-hmm. Stuff starts to break. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's And that that is an issue. That, that makes you sick. It does. You know, one of the uh, one of the examples I liked to give like uh, 10 years ago when people was g- getting blurry eyed when I said the word mitochondria would be like if we shut mitochondria off in your body with the switch for like 30 seconds, you're dead. You're dead. Yeah. So um, and obviously, you know, when we talk about the skin, that, that's probably one of the most you know, the, the biggest culprits for the appearance of our skin, like mitochondrial decline, how our mitochondria are able to function, etc. Yep. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the thing is like, a lot of people don't know about this thing called skin autofluorescence. Mm-hmm. But your skin and the glow that you get from your skin is a really important marker of health. Yeah. So everyone's always asking me, like, how do I know if I'm healthy? And obviously there's a bunch of markers on the inside, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's biomarkers and there's pheno age and there's ways that you can use your, your, your lab markers to determine your health. But a really good marker of health is like, do you have shiny hair? Do you have bright skin? Yeah. Do you have good quality, healthy skin? And so many, I mean, like, look, I, I really think you got to approach skin from the inside out from the outside in. So you can't just like not take care of your skin. I've been, I've been washing my face and exfoliating and using sunscreen and vitamin C since I was in high school. So like I've always cared about skin, but I struggled with breakouts on my back when I was in high school mm-hmm. and it was hormonal and it was gut health and it was insulin resistance. And I didn't really understand those things until I became a doctor. And even after I became a doctor was really when I started figuring out health itself because we're taught disease in medical school and, and we're taught like just, you know, add some benzoyl peroxide and retinol and you'll better skin. And frankly, those things ruined my, my skin. I would, I would get like allergic reactions to that. Like specifically the benzoyl peroxide, I used to just get really swollen skin from, from too much benzoyl peroxide and it just wasn't working for me. And I was like, and, and honestly, um, when I got my gut health sorted out, that was a big step in the right direction of getting my skin better. But, um, People just don't know this stuff. It's not common knowledge. And and like blood sugar is a huge, huge, huge influential factor in skin health, mm-hmm. in wrinkling, in in acne formation. And we don't get taught that in medical school. We're in really mitochondrial health is like not really a big part of your medical medical education because it's very new science. Yeah. Like we just found out about mitochondrial DNA like within like the last 20 years or so, maybe the last 15 years with Douglas Wallace. Yeah. So it's pretty new science. It is, and and you know. What is very interesting to me is um, when we did discover, you know, either either you know the the let's call it the the hallmarks of aging as a whole when they were presented, you know, twenty thirteen um, um, uh, on in, in cell in the seminal paper in cell, etc. Most people are looking at the hallmarks of aging as some kind of you know, as an even playing field, you know, if one doesn't work correctly, it means it, it, it is as important if another one doesn't. And to me, at least, mitochondrial decline is the, let's say, the most influential, is the strongest, um, let's call it player in that in that uh, yeah. field. So it's important to understand yeah. that it, they are not, n- not all uh, created equal. Now, right. Now, what, yeah, I, I do think that almost every hallmark of aging can be attributed to mitochondrial dysfunction. But that being said, I also think that um, 
you know, it's, we, we shouldn't, I, I have a tendency and we all, we all have a tendency to want to simplify things. Mm -hmm. Health is complex, right? Yeah. And, um, but I, I, I think I've really explained a pretty darn good um, model for understanding how mitochondria affect health and why lifestyle factors yeah. affect mitochondria. And it was really not just my work. It was um, the work of Martine Picard and, and, um, and uh, Robert Navio, you know, these two mitochondrial researchers yeah. that really enabled me to see how our lifestyles and how our psychosocial health affects our mitochondrial function. So like, one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book is stress and like stress is not good or bad. It's just part of life. Right. Mm -hmm. So stress can make you stronger if it's not overwhelming stress. But when we have so many different stressors from different directions, that can really break the body because it can drain the batteries. Yeah. And if you don't have enough capacity to meet your demands, stuff starts to break down. Yeah. And, it, and, and that when I understood that, like, oh, stress actually can make me stronger, but also too much stress can break my body. That um, this was like what, launching a book this year and building a company and teaching at Stanford. This is twenty twenty three, twenty twenty two. I did so many things in one year in twenty twenty two, and I literally was like, okay, I got to the very tip of the stress cup. Like it was so close to overflowing, and then I was like, okay, time to take a vacation. Yeah. But I I genuinely feel like the cool thing about optimizing health is that you can just keep building bigger and bigger capacity, so your stress cup gets larger and larger, so you can actually handle more and more without breaking. And that's the beauty of biohacking is that you can actually literally change your body's capacity to handle different demands. Definitely. Do you feel there is a difference so since the book uh, is geared more towards women or is looking through the vantage point of, of, of like mm. addressing biohacking health and, and, and health span, you know, for women specifically, yeah. do you feel that this approach also should be uh, separate for men and women, whether it is building stress, whether it is, um, health optimization? It really, it really depends on, um, a lot of things. First and foremost for women, it's very much dependent on like what age you're at and what place in the fertility cycle you're mm -hmm. at. Right. So like women, like, like young kids generally, like who haven't gotten through puberty yet, their biology is very similar. Mm -hmm. And then when you get through menopause and if you don't take hormones, interestingly, your, your biology starts to resemble more of a man's like, so you, if you don't have a lot of estrogen lying yeah. around, like you start to just, your body changes and you can, and, and, and things are a little bit more neutral, yeah. but when you're going through, you know, when you're premenopausal and you're going through menopause, you're definitely not going to be like a guy because mm -hmm. you, you've got hormones that are changing and those hormones that are changing are really what make women have to be it just gives women a little bit of a disadvantage and a few and some advantages. Like on one hand, women are acutely sensitive to um, emotional cues. Mm -hmm. Like we're very we're, we're very in tune with our emotions, and we're 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 basically riding an emotional roller coaster throughout the month because we have so we just feel like different women at different times mm -hmm. of the month, right? So during the follicular phase, we feel strong and we can go out and do things and we feel like we can hit our personal best at the gym. And then we ovulate and we feel really attractive. Mm -hmm. And then we go through luteal phase and we're kind of more tired and relaxed, a little bit more moodier. And then you hit your, your, your period and some women really struggle with their period. Some women don't, but your period is a pretty good barometer of your overall health. And so you know, you're changing a lot, but you're also like, what women who are in tune with their bodies realize there's going to be times of the month where I'm going to be more emotional. There's going to be times yeah. of the month where I'm going to be more stressed and I have to be more careful with my energy. Mm -hmm. And then with men, they don't really have this kind of cycle. They can do a lot more intense biohacking and in and in, without breaking down as quickly. Yeah. So like a woman who does too much fasting. And by the way, I've, I've, I've actually done too much fasting in the past. So like, I know, I know what it's like to have fasting transform my health mm -hmm. and also to overdo it. And the thing about fasting is that you just got to be a little bit more careful with, with as a woman than a man. Men can be a little bit men can be a little bit more um, risk taking when it comes to fasting. But women have to be very careful because we can affect our hormones, we can affect our mood, we can affect our our body fat, and we can affect um, you know our stress levels first and foremost. So mm -hmm. we're we have a biological imperative to to re reproduce, and <clears throat> men obviously have a biological imperative to spread their seed and help us reproduce, but women's jobs are to keep a baby and the tribe alive with food. Yeah. <laughs> so like if we go through too much food deprivation, our thyroid hormones gets dysfunctional or cortisol goes up and we start prioritizing hormonal signals to survive and not to reap. So like last year when I was under like the most stress I've ever been under aside from maybe residency, mm -hmm. um, 
my estrogen levels got lower as my cortisol levels rose. And it was really interesting because I was like, oh yeah, I definitely need to cut back on my stress levels. I definitely need to start doing more recovery because I was seeing the effects on my hormones and I'd measure my hormones and I measure my labs. So I'm the kind of person who's keeping tabs on these things. And like the beauty of having data is that I can actually make better decisions yeah. about my health. So like aura rings, can, uh, having an aura ring is really great. Having a blood sugar monitor is really great. Um, it's just really key to keep tabs on your health if you can. Um, men, on the other hand, in terms of the, what they need to do differently with biohacking, like one of the big things I talk about in the book is um, social connection mm -hmm. and love and sexuality. And so this is really kind of left out of biohacking in general is like these, these facets of our, of our health, but they're really important. And like one in five men don't have any friends. Wow. And that actually causes a lot of stress on the nervous system, not to have a tribe. So like the, the thing about women is women are generally more social and we're more, we're just, we generally, we, we communicate a lot more, we connect a lot more. And so it's really, really important for men and women both to prioritize healthy relationships mm -hmm. as a biohacking strategy, because it's a big part of your survival strategy. And at the, when, you know, when the world goes crazy, like what we went through with, with the pandemic, you know, being isolated is not great for our health. We have, we've learned this. Mm -hmm. And so now that we've all, we've kind of been through this pandemic and we're kind of coming out of it and we're in this new normal, um, everybody needs to emphasize building a tribe and building a community. And that's one of the things I love about the biohacking world is that there's such a great community. I agree. I think, you know, biohacking in general, um, whether you, you like the word, but whether you don't like the word, I think any word that you're going to be using and you're, you're attaching your, your journey to will eventually lead you to find people who are, I don't know if like-minded, but at least are on the same path, on the same journey. Yeah. And that is, that could build a community around a journey and not necessarily um, uh, take take a toll on the journey that you're going through. Because a lot of the times, especially, you know, you're, a, you're kind of uh, an OG in the biohacking field. I remember being a biohacker like 10 years ago before, before I knew yeah. that I am one. Uh, it, totally. It was a little lonely. I mean, no one knew what I'm talking about. No one knew. I know. You know what? I remember talking about leaky gut in like 2014, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I remember finding Dr. Josh Axe talking about leaky gut. And that was like my aha moment. There is another one person in the world that even knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, so exactly. The, the, uh, I, and, and, you know, fast forward, uh, going to the biohacking conference 2021, I want to say, uh, Dave Asprey's yeah. uh, biohacking conference, realizing how many people are now a, a, a like me in, in, in our journey. That was to me a, a, a yeah. an amazing moment to be, to be frank. Yeah. So, I mean, it's now cool to see there's a huge movement. I mean, yeah. it sparked an entire industry, mm -hmm. so many companies, yeah. so many podcasts. I mean, literally like when we think about health today, there's, there's kind of like sort of like the goop version of health, mm -hmm. you know? And then there's like biohacking. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, and biohacking is just such a, um, it's, it's not just a trend. It's like, it's a, it's a revolution and a movement mm -hmm. against feeling like the system is failing us when it comes to keeping us healthy. Yeah. Right. The system isn't designed to optimize your health. No. It's designed to make sure that if you have serious sickness, you don't die. Yeah. And so we need to stop expecting that from the healthcare system and also like build products and services that do improve health. Definitely. Now, within that realm, uh, obviously, one of the m hottest topics is talking about how, you know, m women are underrepresented within that field, right? Within that um, field of, of, of uh, research into medicine at, as a whole, uh, they're, they're, as you said, they're not really good test subjects because you're going to get, you know, one woman uh, in her luteal phase, another one postmenopausal, they can be the same age as well, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of uh, different variable that makes them less attractive as, as a test subject. And in the end, you know, the, uh, the uh, outline we're getting into, into health from allopathic medicine, from conventional medicine is a little, let's call it a little skewed to one side. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, talking. But yeah. I mean, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. like, you know, we, we know the people working in the healthcare system know this, by yeah. the way, like most of these doctors are aware 
that there's a skew and there's a problem. Like they just don't know what to do about it. A hundred percent. And that's why I, I love what you said about lab testing and in general, just inf- gathering information that is an N of one, just like information about you specifically is that you can, you can kind of test obviously carefully and, and responsibly, but you can kind of test what works for you and what, what doesn't and adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Um, Talking about nutrition, because because that's that yeah. was what we started with. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think uh, is a good way to kind of test your your parameter? What what works for you? What doesn't work for you? Um, as a whole and as and as a woman. Well, I would say the first thing is I'm a big big fan of blood sugar monitoring. Mm-hmm. So like, um, I love my 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 CGM. Mm-hmm. Like it's just. One of those things that I keep putting on and I keep using year after year after year. And I was like one of the first doctors in 2014 to just start studying these things on healthy people and myself. And I was borderline pre-diabetic. So, you know, now my blood sugar is running a little low and I'm like, "Uh oh, I need to eat something. Um, (laughs) But I also eat low carb. So it generally runs lower. But, you know, when I was under a lot of stress this last year in 2022, my blood sugar started getting really erratic and my my like actual glycemic variability was pretty out of control. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, I really need some time off. Cause I was just working too much. Right. And yeah. like, I basically spent a whole month just like doing nothing but working in November. And it showed itself in my CGM. I could yeah. see that my blood, I was getting insulin resistant because I wasn't getting enough recovery. And because my cortisol was too high. Yeah. That is something you just can't get from anything else right now. It's so fast, so easy. It's just such a great tool. Now you have to learn how to interpret it. And I wouldn't say any company right now, even the ones I advise, like nobody's really nailed the software Mm -hmm. and nobody's really nailed the interpretation. But if you know how to interpret it, it's game changing. And so finding a a coach or a doctor who knows how to use these, it's not easy, but um, they do exist and they are getting more and more popular. So that's a big, that's a big, that's a big thing. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, a good thing about about finding a doctor or finding a professional that can deal with it is that they don't have to see you in person, right? You can send them the results and, and they can kind of have a, an online session, like a Zoom session to interpret them and, and, to, and to guide you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, I would also say that I'm a big fan of stool studies mm-hmm. and um, urine, urine organic acids. Mm-hmm. So you can, and I also like hair minerals testing. Mm-hmm. So like if you want to analyze a person's overall metabolic health and they're also micronutrients in their dietary health, <clears throat> you got to look at markers of metabolism. So I'm, I'm, that's why I use the NutriVal by Genova Diagnostics or Metabolomics test. Mm-hmm. And then I also use um, stool studies to identify how well a gut's functioning. Cause if your gut isn't well, then there's a lot of micro, there's a lot of microbiome, mitochondrial crosstalk, and you're just going to have a lot of inflammation in the body and that's going to drain your capacity. It's going to cause a lot of um, damage to your cells. So you got to, you got to keep tabs on your metabolic health through your gut health. Mm-hmm. And then um, air minerals is really important because it's not easy to get minerals on your, your organic acids. Mm-hmm. They won't, they'll give you more micronutrients and vitamins and maybe some minerals. But if you want to do minerals testing, there's a company called upgraded formulas um and they have great minerals um products and mineral hair minerals testing direct to consumer so i i use all those things to actually measure metabolism amazing so so going into um stool testing obviously uh gut microbiome we i i'm, I'm it's fascinating to me that we're going through like a, a a adjacent journey to everything that affects the skin like without talking about we talk about blood sugar spikes and obviously that leads to um glycation which which really affects collagen etc now we're talking about uh the crosstalk between our gut and either mitochondria inflammation etc which obviously affects our skin and and the way we we age as a whole and, and talking about like um um gut health and and um and um stool testing mm-hmm. this is not a new concept but really the accuracy and the reliability of these tests have transformed in the last few years right mm-hmm. yeah because I'd say so. Yeah, because I mean, and the widespread use and adoption of them. I mean, there's so there's more and more doctors, naturopaths, chiropractors, you name it, using functional testing. Yeah. And if you know how to interpret functional testing, like you've got a guidebook for actually just doing an anal- analysis of the body's health. Yeah. Um, so w- aside from from obviously the normal, you know, supplementing on probiotics, etc. 
what are some of the strategies that, that you implement in order to improve uh, gut microbiome or to improve uh, gut function? I mean, if I'm not really stressed out, fasting is great mm-hmm. for just if you have if you have any bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. A little bit of fasting is really helpful for that. I've had people, you know, fix their fix their you know SIBO through mm-hmm. fasting, and then um, I also know people who have inflammatory bowel diseases who fix their gut through fasting. Wow! So just like eating less often, fasting, like and just not snacking as much, even if you're not going to fast, just snack like maybe twelve hours a night, and then just not snacking as much. Mm-hmm. That's really helpful for reducing uh, bacterial overgrowth in the gut, and then um, and then some people who take antibiotics. And they actually have undergrowth of, my, of of good microbes. And so, you know, if you've had an antibiotic exposure recently, highly recommend you, you know, redose yourself with probiotics mm-hmm. and fermented foods. Um, now, fermentation and fermented foods are really, and, and probiotics, you got to be a little bit careful if you're somebody who has allergies and atopy, mm-hmm. asthma, eczema, because you may be more sensitive to histamine producing probiotics. So, and histamine, you know, in food. So these are people who would not do well with leftovers or would not want to do cured meats or preserved foods. Um, They want to do more fresh foods. Mm -hmm. So we really got to personalize this stuff. Um, I've had people do a stool study and see there's blood in their stool and they ended up having a polyp that could have grown into colon cancer if they hadn't removed it. So that's cool. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, H. pylori, you got to treat that. If you don't, if you, if you have H. pylori, it can cause ulcers. So that's a big no. Mm -hmm. And it can also cause gastric cancer. So these are all just kind of examples of ways that you can take this data. You can also see if you're producing things like, um, you know, like there's a odorobacter formagenes, I believe is what it's called. It's a, it's a oxalobacter formagenes Mm -hmm. and it's a bacteria that degrades oxalates. So somebody who has low oxalobacter may be at higher risk for things like kidney stones. Um, and then for people who, so these, these people who just want to avoid oxalates yeah. as much in, in, in their diet. And then for people who are um, high in methanol, um, there's certain strains of bacteria called like methanobacter smithy. It's like a bacteria that produces methane. So if somebody's really, really high in that one, I might want to check them for methane SIBO, if they, mm-hmm. especially if they have symptoms. Um, and then there's also things like, um, like what's the last one? Um, you know, there's, there's different bacteria that can be associated with metabolism issues. Yeah. And um, there's a company called Pendulum Probiotics, and they actually create a – what is it called? I'm trying to think of the bacteria that it is. But it's a bacteria that if you have too little of it, um, you can end up with um, increased risk of, of diabetes and mm-hmm. prediabetes. So you can take probiotics to modulate metabolism. So mm-hmm. I think we're, we're, just, we're just beginning the frontier of probiotic health, and like personalized probiotics are a big thing now too. 100%. And, uh, yeah, because, you know, you, you – you should obviously cultivate the uh, bacteria in your gut according to what's going on in your gut and not just uh, an mm-hmm. over our, overarching uh, approach, blanket could actually do more harm than good. Um, you did mention fasting. You mentioned low carb. Um, and I know you're a big proponent of something we talk about a lot here, which is metabolic flexibility. How would you, first of all, how would you define it? And obviously we are, ta- we are talking about testing and measuring. And that's something that, you know, I think we within metabolic flexibility, we're still kind of behind a little bit. So first, how, how do you define? Sure. Um, metabolic flexibility is the ability to easily f- switch between carb and fat metabolism. Mm-hmm. And um, the way I know if I'm metabolically flexible is like if I don't eat for a few hours or if I eat really low carb for a few days and I my blood sugar is low, but I feel fine. Mm-hmm. And I'm and I can smell ketones or test and have ketones in my in my my, my urine or mm-hmm. my blood then I know I'm flipping the metabolic switch. Mm-hmm. And flipping the metabolic switch is when you switch from carbs to fats, yeah. fat burning. But you can also use this device here and you can actually see like, what am I burning right now? Yeah. You can just, you know, use it with, it's called Lumen. Mm-hmm. And um, I might need to charge this one. I'm not sure. Um, but basically it's a device that measures your respiratory quotient. And it is a thing that you blow into. And these things used to be like an entire rooms of hospitals mm-hmm. to measure metabolism. And now you can just get this like my, you know, this device, that's this small. So I've been, I've been, I was advising this company a long time ago and, um, I'm, I just love seeing them succeed. It's really great to, to see them. I agree. And they are all, flourish. obviously they're not the only one in the market as far as like, um, ketone meters that are, that are, you know, through breath. But what I love about Lumen specifically is the, is the interface, right? Uh, are, are the, uh, yeah. the in, insights that you can get from it. Um, I yeah. think that is, they're, they're really unique 
in the field as far as that so is they've concerned. done a really i mean they're israeli scientists and so they really know their science and mm -hmm. they they've ta they've taught me i mean they were really the ones who taught me about metabolic flexibility they sent me all these papers mm -hmm. and i was like because i used the device initially to lose some weight before my sister's wedding mm -hmm. and i lost like i don't know five six pounds in like a couple weeks really quickly and i was like this thing's awesome mm -hmm. um but it was just helping me track my my you know that i was in ketosis um and I'm not really into continuous ketosis anymore, but I do like eating low carb in general. Mm -hmm. I feel healthiest when I eat low carb. Um, and it just it just works for me. But not everybody needs to be low carb. Some people thrive on higher carb diets. Yeah. Uh, would you say that this is something that also helps uh, deal with the uh, hormonal imbalance, like keeping it, keeping low carb or fluctuating, fluctuating between ketosis and... and yeah. Uh, gl I mean, gl it's, it's really just it's like qual mitochondrial quality control, mm -hmm. you know, like if you're always eating carbs all day long, you're never really giving your body the ability to burn fats. And one of the things that I, I, I think is true is I've been asking myself, like, why is it that people get visceral fat? Mm -hmm. You know, like where does visceral fat come from? And I really think it's pretty simple. Like if you are eating and overeating food and also overeating high fat, high carb foods, mm -hmm. your metabolism is going to prioritize carb burning. Because in the in the presence of insulin, it metabolizes it, it's, it prioritizes carbs, mm -hmm. and so now you're eating like all these carbs, and then you've got all this fat lying around that's waiting to be eaten, but you've got a traffic jam in the cells because they're like so busy burning carbs that it's like what are you gonna do with all the fat? Mm -hmm. And I'm just I'm just like there's only one explanation of how visceral fat forms. It's like it literally is like a backlog of fat that hasn't been metabolized because your body's in carb metabolism for mm -hmm. too long. And I just, I kind of feel like most people aren't looking at the bodies properly. They're not like thinking first principles, like what's really happening under the hood. And the vast majority of people are never flip, 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 flipping the metabolic switch. Yeah. They're eating late at night. They're eating high fat, high carb foods. They're eating lots of fast foods, processed foods. And these foods are the vast majority of the human diet. And they've got fatty liver. And so they've got inefficient metabolism. And so they start getting these big guts and these, these guts, these big wide waist circumferences are also the result of cortisol. Yeah. So somebody with a high cortisol state is going to have a higher waist circumference because you literally like it, it's, it must be a metabolic adaptation on purpose to keep fuel near the organs where they would be digested. Like that has to be the explanation of why cortisol would cause, mm -hmm. you know, abdominal fat because like it's easily accessed, you know, it's like, it's like, it's there, it's next to the organs problem is, is that when you start getting this fat really infiltrating the organ tissues themselves, then they start to break down. Yeah. So, you know, this is why fatty liver is so damaging. It can cause cirrhosis and mm -hmm. even liver transplants. Yeah. I love how you uh, refer to, you know, cortisol as cortisol and not just using the word stress because uh, in, in general, the, uh, your approach to stress, because there are different types of stress, as you mentioned before. Um, and and it's really important to really zero hone in on on cortisol levels and even the the timing of cortisol is in order to understand what's harming us and what's not. Um, yeah. Do you feel like, uh, for, particularly for women, um, is there a different way relationship as far as stress uh, for when men and women, and um, maybe inducing stress? I mean, it seems like. Just anecdotally, it yeah. seems like men's stress cups are just a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Like they can handle a little bit more. And I think that's partially because men's initial job in human existence back in primitive times was to go fight and to go hunt, right? Yeah. And not that women didn't hunt or fight, but women were kind of made sure that the tribe was alive and mm -hmm. babies were raised. And you wouldn't really necessarily go take a baby out to go hunting, right? So, um, so when you think about that biological imperative, it's like, it makes sense that men are a little bit more wired for handling aggression mm -hmm. and for being, you know, being offensive or defensive if necessary. Um, men are base oppressed and dominant. Yeah. That means men's jobs in, society, in, in like primitive times were to protect and defend the tribe and to aggress if they were being attacked. Yeah. And so women, you know, are, are oxytocin dominant. We're, we're really designed to connect and to nurture and, and to, um, and to basically help, you know, help promote life. Yeah. And this is a beautiful polarity that exists for a reason. 
um, because it helped propagate life. Right. Yeah. And, um, Gender is a really compl complicated topic in modern life for some reason. I don't really know why it's become this thing that everyone is like so pissed off about. Yeah. But I really think polarity is important. And I think it's – polarity is like one of the one of the core rules of existence. Like if you, you lose polarity, life does not propagate. So I have a masculine side and a feminine side, but I'm fundamentally female. And, yeah. um, and I think that like – you know, we've created a society that's very much a, a man's world and, and, it, and it is what it is. It just, it's designed by men and women having to operate in a man's world means that we have to sometimes ignore our physiological signals. Mm -hmm. And like, it, it was only this year that I really started because I was writing this book and I was just like trying to explain like why we're different. I was like, man, even though I know that I should take more time off around my period and that I shouldn't schedule so many calls and podcasts, I still found myself overworking during my period and before my period when I was the most, when I had the least amount of, um, least amount of, uh, energy. Yeah. And I do think that may have contributed a little bit to my cortisol excess because I wasn't really respecting the, the sort of rhythm, the rhythms of my life. Yeah. And so I finally am at a point where I do think that I'm, um, I'm actually able to create space, but it was, it's, it's been a battle. I mean, it is like a constant, like having to track my period and keep like, okay, what am I doing during that? Cause I know like two days before my period, I'm going to be tired Yeah. and it takes real, you know, like awareness of my body's rhythms to say, yeah, I'm not going to do that extra call that day, even though like I want to, and I have a tendency to want to just work through everything. Mm -hmm. And yet I know it, I know it has consequences. And yeah, and um, I feel, you know, I think it go it, it divides into two categories. I think most people, especially physically, they have, they, they use, you know, the cycles as, as excuses to um, lay off when maybe they shouldn't lay off or to, um, let's well, call. Well, it's not necessarily about like giving up all your responsibilities, mm -hmm. but it is about giving yourself some time for reflection and inner and like rest, yeah. you know? Yeah, 100%. And also to kind of push yourself when you can push yourself, when it is that time of yeah. the month to push yourself. So Absolutely. So what are some of the strategies that you implement that you that you like as far as like um, um, recovering from stress? Because a lot of the times it's, yeah, we, we go through stress, like it's inevitable, but what do we do to recover yeah. from it? What do we do yeah. to de-stress? So, so last year, I, um, I mean, I, I really feel like I got... I, the funny thing about biohacking is like when my life was a little bit less stressed out, mm -hmm. um, I didn't do as much recovery, but this last year, because I had so much going on, I was like, heck Molly, you've got a whole entire living room of biohacking <laughs> tools. Why aren't you using them? Yeah. So I started using my PEMF mats. I, I literally have one under my desk right here mm -hmm. that I'm just going to like turn on, put on my feet and just like use as a tool in the tool spot, toolbox. Mm -hmm. Let's see, is it going to turn on? Uh, maybe it didn't charge. I don't think it charged. Um, but I love PEMF because it's kind of like a human battery charger. I also love, um, you know, a Theragun and sauna. Yeah. And um, sauna and cold plunges at my gym. So I like to go to my gym and, and use those. Massage has always really been important to me. I need to get a massage this week or next week for sure. <laughs> um, and then uh, what else? Um, aside from massage. Yeah, I might get a massage next week in LA when I'm there. <laughs> um, and then on top of that um, is, let's see here. Um, you know, I love I love red light therapy. Yeah. It's just sitting in front of red light can be really nice. And um, I have infrared mats that I can lay on too. Sometimes I just go and lay lay on those and like read before I go to bed. Um, and then I like acupressure mats as well. Yeah, I found that they actually do improve HRV at least on my 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 wearable. Breath work is really great. Um, just deep breathing before you go to sleep and meditation first thing in the morning. Um, you know, like I definitely spend a fair amount of time before bed and in the morning before I wake up, just like laying there thinking about, um, you know, either meditating, prayer or visualization. Yeah. So those are my big ones, I'd say. And then obviously taking a vacation when you need to. Like I took like two very memorable vacations last year and then um, – I guess three. And, um, and I think taking time off is really important, really, really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's really actually taking real time off is key. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, so you talked about like the the uh, apart the biohacking apartment you have over there. Um, what's some, what are some of the like emerging emerging uh, strategies, emerging research as far as in in the biohacking community for like health optimization? What are you excited about? Oh, I mean, I have a bunch of random stuff in my fridge from different health providers, including. Um, NAD patches mm-hmm. from the company Ion Layer mm-hmm. that Anthony Gustin just launched, and I'm super stoked about that product. Um, I, I started using these patches in 20. Let's see here. Uh, I think it was like 20 2019. It was maybe the first time I started using these patches, and so it's cool to see it's 2020, almost three 2023, and now they're like catching on. Yeah. Mm. So NAD is a big one. Um, I didn't write about it in my book cause I wasn't like totally certain that it was, um, it was like, I was just like, I was still somewhat skeptical. Mm-hmm. And then I just, I did an NAD weekend with my friend Katrine. Yeah. Um, and I just like, oh my God, I felt like a new woman after that. I needed it so badly after having COVID last year and it was like game changing. And then peptides are a big one. Um, I mean, specifically because we know that insulin resistance is a huge cause of disease and like, you know, MOTC and semaglutide and Wagovi and all these GLP-1 inhibitors, um, these peptides are game changing for people yeah. who have obesity and diabetes. And so it's like, these are, you know, really interesting medicines. And um, I'm just like excited to see, you know, there's another peptide PT-141 mm-hmm. that I just ordered some to try. And it's like a arousal agent for men and women. And I mean, like, who doesn't want more arousal? I mean, I'm, I don't really need it, but I'm interested in, in um, how we can, you know, provide it to people. Yeah, 100%. Talking about, speaking about Katrine and, and uh, uh, NAD retreats in, in Sedona, um, did you, yeah. what do you think about methylene blue, whether it is as like Katrine does it, which is through an IV or uh, orally um, suppositories? Yeah. I mean, I love, love, love methylene blue. The biggest problem is supply mm-hmm. and sourcing. So I, I didn't write about it in the book, not because it wasn't useful, but because I know most people don't know how, don't, don't know how to get their hands on good stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there, like most of what's sold on Amazon is for aquariums. Yeah. So, you know, we definitely want people to be sourcing it from doctors and pharmacists, but it's just not widely available. So it's a great tool though in the toolbox. In fact, I need to get some. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love uh, transcriptions. I take it. Uh, every I take some. I just don't like my tongue. I don't like my tongue blue. Okay, so tongue. that is something that um, I hope they don't watch. They didn't. Get, they don't get forty minutes into this episode, uh, so they don't uh, get mad at me. But I swallow it. I mean, it it oh. it shows ninety percent availability in the gut. Oh my god! Yeah, so wow. I just swallow it. Um, I don't like two things that, as far as like. Um, as far as uh, bulk out uh, trochies, uh, which they have, one is obviously uh, your tongue blue. If 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 it's you know if it's not appropriate, you know if I go to a dinner and again I'm I'm the only biohacker, you know good luck uh, explaining why why your tongue is blue. That's number one, and number two, um, I I take the uh, the one that they have that has more than methylene blue like it has a little bit of nicotine like a microdose of nicotine and, and oh yeah etc you like it I do I love it uh, the the problem is is that if I do contact sports and I have a mouth guard on then I it oh. it, it, it permanently stains it so these are the two things yeah. that that are problematic for me as far as like uh, mm-hmm. those specifically mm-hmm. uh, so yeah obviously I prefer using it um, um, uh, through my gums, absorbing it through my gums, especially if I do like red light therapy or something like that. But in general, I'll just swallow them most of the time. And I take either the, the uh, only methylene blue one or, or the uh, one that's the combination every day. Um, what I need to get on there. I need to get on these. I'm going to text Scott right now. Mm-hmm. Text Scott. Uh, tell him that, uh, that, that don't don't snitch. Don't tell him that I I, I told you that you can solve oh. them. <laughs> uh, what about some other like uh, let's call them like uh, you know more more fringe type of supplements uh, that you're taking? What about stuff like uh, mm. spermidine? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are big. I mean, Amy, Amy Killen loves spermidine. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not currently taking spermidine 
because I just um, I really focus on my supplementation based on what I really yeah. need in the moment right now mm -hmm. and like my big goal and like I, I have a whole supplement <laughs> kit I'd have to go get it to actually see what I'm taking right now but um, I'm taking a skin supplement by Neurohacker mm -hmm. because I'm gonna be in a lot of appearances in the next month so I like their Neurohacker's quality of skin is quite I love good it. for appearances it's great it's a great um, product because it it has so many carotenoids and skin promoting ingredients mm -hmm. and I actually did know notice a difference when I started taking it so I was like I had a bottle and I was like I'm gonna start taking this yeah. again um I just finished a bottle of AFA algae that I was really I really liked and it's got a lot of minerals in it so I do need to get another bottle of that um I have Masszymes from um, BioOptimizers mm -hmm. because, you know, got to gotta love a good digestion. Yeah. And when you're traveling a lot and you're under a lot of stress, your digestion suffers. So I, I hugely believe in that product. Um, I wasn't really a believer in enzymes for a long time until um, this company came along and mm -hmm. I finally was like – and actually I read this guy, Christopher Gonzalez's work, um, who sadly un unfortunately passed. But he has yeah. a great, great research on just the role of enzymes in health. And so – um, probiotics because I had to take antibiotics last year, uh -huh. so I'm still taking some probiotics. Um, and then what else am I on? I'm on vitamin D, B, B complex, mm -hmm. a big old heck of a lot of omega threes. Um, I really, I, I like, I mega dose omegas. Do you, do you have a brand that you like? Uh, that is do, probably the most important. Here's like... the thing. I can't promote the brand cause they're not available in America. So I can't give people the name yeah. cause you can't get them. Now I know which brand but... you're taking. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's and the founder is an absolute yeah crazy human, uh -huh. but um and he's really mad at me right now, but whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> um yeah, I, I I feel bad about that relationship because this this person's very pissed at me. But um anyway, moving on. Mm -hmm. Um also taking magnesium and can't really live without magnesium. Yeah, it's, it's a key key uh, ingredient in metabolism. Um, Do you take the one? I'm taking because you I'm did experimenting man with things like. Uh -huh. You did mention uh, two companies, which I love their magnesiums, which is uh, one. Uh, Bio-optimizers. Yeah. Bio-optimizers. I also love upgraded formulas yeah. magnesium. They have a really good magnesium for night. Mm -hmm. um, that, that stuff works for sleep. Um, so the big ones that most people need are omegas, AB complex, vitamin D, K1, K2 is in my, is my, my vitamin D, mm -hmm. magnesium, minerals. Um, but most people are also aren't going to test their bodies. Like I test my body to see what I need. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, whatever you're trying to optimize. So like, I also typically take supplements for choline metabolism, yeah. usually CDB choline right now. I only have uridine in, in, in my house. I'm also taking saffron because mm -hmm. it's great for mood. And then also I sometimes take skeletium for mood. If I want to feel really happy, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like a legal Molly, yeah. <laughs> but you can take small doses of it and it's great. If you take high doses of it, it can get, get you high, mm -hmm. but if you take small doses of it, it's great. So I, I took that yesterday because I had been out late then that week, like last weekend with some friends and I just felt like I needed a little boost, but saffron I, I'm pretty much consistently taking because it gives me such a great, it just overall improves dopamine metabolism. Yeah. But I have to say there is a new biohack I discovered that's pretty groundbreaking and it's this company called Think Interfaces, and Lana Morrow is the founder. And I'm not even joking. I did four days of her. It's like a neurofeedback frequency-based device mm -hmm. where you play a video game with your brain. And it made a massive improvement in my ADHD. Wow. Like, I am not even joking. This, this thing is like – and not only did it improve my ADHD, it improved my mood. And it, like, made me more attractive. Wow. So, like, I'm like, lady, can we get this thing, please, into the world? It's incredible. So it's not available yet in, in you know, widespread? You can get it. Um, if you come to Austin, mm -hmm. they do offer sessions at Alive and Well. But they're very much, like, in, in stealth right now. They're not really wide, 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 widely available. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, it's going to beat out 40 years of Zen. I'm, and, I, and sorry, Dave, I was just on your podcast. But <laughs> this, this is going to beat out. That's interesting. We're going to be in Austin soon, so I'm going to make sure to, to check it out. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you to, to remind me where to get it. Um, so, yeah, that's as far as supplements. Uh, you, you did mention, like, um, do you do any uh, transdermal, uh, uh, transcranial direct stimulation, anything like that for brain function at all? Um, no, because I don't understand it well mm -hmm. enough to do it, but I also don't have a depression. Yeah. Um, my big issue is I, I, I can't seem to stop, uh, being an achievement oriented mm -hmm. human. 
Like, I'm like, this is the year I'm going to have balance. And then I'm like <laughs> going to Dubai right after I launched my book, you know, like, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. but I got a free trip. I got a free trip to Dubai. So like, that's cool. Um, I did have to pay my plane ticket, but I did get a free ticket to a cool conference in Dubai. Very and I was cool. like, what a great gift to give myself. But I, I guess I'm trying to achieve more, more balance. And, um, but I do stress myself out fairly well. <laughs> and yeah. yet at the same time, like, I know if I just did like 10% as much as what I'm doing, I would be more productive. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just feel mm -hmm. like weirdly I'm at 39 on January. I'm about, I'll be 39 at the end of the month. And like, I kind of feel like I'm just getting started, which is kind of funny because I've been at this for like 10 years, but it feels like I'm finally hitting my stride. Yeah. So I'm really excited about the next 10 years. I'm like stoked about where life is going to go for me. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I have a great community of family and friends around me that are so supportive yeah and definitely uh, you know i feel uh like you're only getting started like that you have so much to give Thanks. to the world um very 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 excited for you uh especially for dubai in the winter you know dubai in the summer is no no that's not going to be a good trip but now uh seems like a wonderful time to go to dubai uh, how about yeah, it's, apparently it's kind of it's kind of neutral weather mm -hmm. and it's yeah. like kind of nice weather yeah in the winter time there. what about um, um yeah. Uh, microdosing psychedelics, uh, as far as balance, uh, as far I as I mean, I can't microdose, um, psilocybin because it gives me serious anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why, but I get really anxious if I microdose psilocybin. So I just don't microdose. Yeah. It's not my thing. I, I have a lot of friends who swear by it, but, um, I don't really recommend it because it doesn't work for me yeah. and because it's not legal yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's going to be legal. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're going to see microdosing available someday. The problem is, is that the the research seems to suggest it's, you know, I think it's like a super placebo. Mm -hmm. I think it does activate oxytocin, but I think oxytocin is the reason why the placebo response works. So I think that like, I think mind, mind med is really interesting company to follow because they're studying microdosing LSD yeah. for ADHD. I'm so hoping that that thing works in their studies because I would do if it was if it was like an available in a pharmaceutical grade, yeah. properly dosed. I would I would totally do that. But it's it's getting studied, so it might be in the next ten years. We'll see. Um, but yeah, like psychedelic revolution is very exciting. Um, but there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Yeah, for sure. A lot. For you sure. Know, we have a lot. We have a long way to go before we can start recommending these across the board to people. One hundred percent. I've actually become even more like more conservative with my beliefs around the potential for psychedelics because I've seen a lot of damage happened to people with overusing them. Um, you know, so to me, I just, I, I think we all need to take a step back. And as much as I'm like a very like excited about the future of psychedelics, we need to not treat them like they're going to just like solve all of our problems. Cause they actually can cause problems for people as I've seen this last year. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great point because the way that the American system, the medical system works is if we want to make something legal, the easiest way, the low, lowest hanging fruit is to say, treat something like we could see what happened yeah. as far as like marijuana and, and the, the route that every state basically takes. I mean, we're in Florida, uh, we're kind of mid midway, Texas is a little bit behind where you're at, but, um, Basically, like the way to legalize uh, marijuana in the, in the United States is first to classify it as a treatment and then have it for a while prescribed yeah. and then legalize it. I mean, and uh, it seems like psilocybin is going in the same way. And the problem is, is that I hear a lot of people just referring to it as medicine or something like that when really they are not using it medically or to treat anything well, really. They're not even using it ritualistically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. No, don't get me wrong. Like, I do think that. If you actually look at the actual science and the studies and the papers that analyze all drugs, including alcohol and cigarettes, psilocybin is at the end of risk, mm -hmm. right? It's like the lowest risk of all these things. So that's part of the reason why I do anticipate we will see a recreational market just yeah. like marijuana for products like psilocybin. Um, and we should because it is fairly safe. And as long as we can get these things dosed properly, like as long as you know what you're taking and they're, and they're safe, like these are getting decriminalized all over the country. Yeah. So I do think that proper dosing of psilocybin is far lower risk for health, especially if you're not doing heroic doses. If yeah. I'm talking like maybe a gram or something, it's far safer than alcohol. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the science is just patently there. Now it's definitely still a schedule one. You can still get arrested for it. You can still go to jail for it. So, and it's not, it's not fully legal. Even if it's decriminalized, it's still not federally legal. 
So we can't just act like this thing is like everyone should take it because mm-hmm. it's not true. Not everybody's a candidate for it. Some people can, some people, there's more and more bipolar people out there. There's more and more psychosis out there. Like if you have any risk of mental illness, you really should be under the care of a doctor yeah. before you even consider experimenting with stuff like that. But I'm really interested in the traditional uses of these things for helping people with um, healing from, you know, conditions of like diseases of despair and social injury. Yeah. So I, I really am curious about, you know, the indigenous use of these and how we can incorporate some of the indigenous practices into modern medicine. Yeah. Like that to me is really exciting and interesting. And at the same time, like Justin Mayers wrote in his newsletter on Substack that like he has found that MDMA has like really improved his marriage. Mm-hmm. And there's a woman, Ann Wagner, studying MDMA in um in Canada for 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 couples. The fact is is that MDMA was given to five hundred thousand people before it got um scheduled as um by the DEA. Mm-hmm. It was given to like five hundred thousand people safely. Mm-hmm. And um and I do think we're gonna see it get approved for PTSD. But I also think that it's possible it can help people with relationship problems and um sexual dysfunction. So there's a lot of research coming in the in, in these medicines. But again, we need to figure out how to create the right setting, how to create the right mindset, how to create the right integration programs. Um, I'm personally working on a company that's developing a drug agnostic protocol for um, for sexual dysfunction. And I think that MDMA, once it's approved, could be a tool in the toolbox um, through clinical you know, administration. But we, we do need to wait for it to get to that point. Yeah, I think, you know, we all need to, I mean, if we could take a step back and, and really figure out how we deal with um, with the different uh, neurotransmitters that, that we have in our brain. Like what I'm, when I'm saying that my resolution for 2023, for example, is have a different relationship with dopamine, for example, have it, have mm, it. Uh, a great resolution. Yeah. I mean that, and that, I think it's a very like, um, meta uh high level resol- yeah. like high resolution type of um yeah. reso- resolution right because what you what i what i, I want to do is to work hard for my dopamine hits that that is yes uh, i think something that most of us are not considering the fact that we should be working hard for for you know dopamine serotonin whatever that is um and 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 creating that relationship and sometimes if we take a drug or anything like a shortcut the problem is is that it does not work you talked about indigenous um practices it does not work in congruence with what we were evolved to do etc yeah so yeah well the thing is is that what what's happened is is companies have hijacked it mm-hmm. on purpose yeah. right like it's being hijacked on purpose so that people um, buy stuff. Right. So people actually like move yeah. and do things and like eat foods and like, you know, these, these foods, these package processed foods are designed to hit the bliss point. Yeah. They're designed to cause in extreme, you know, I, I have photos of my nieces that the first cupcake they each got and they look like they are screaming with pleasure beyond comprehension. It's like, they're having the craziest <laughs> mouth orgasm. They're just like, ah, and it's just like so excited to eat this cupcake. And it's like, they're clearly high on dopamine. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And it yeah. starts young. And like, I, I know that. Okay. So like last year I went to a party, someone brought out, you know, dessert that was gluten-free <laughs> and I was celebrating because it was like, a, you know, it was a party and it was like, I hadn't been out for a while. And I was like, you know, I accomplished a lot and I was like, all right, I'm going to have a good night out. And I ate some gluten-free desserts. And I remember after having been, eating low carb and being working out consistently and being really fit and strong and having almost no sugar for many, many months. I was like, I felt like my nieces. I was like, Oh my Mm -hmm. God. I was like, this is like crazy how much dopamine I'm getting in my head right now. So the, the fun part about not eating sugar very often is that when you do eat sugar, you get this insane high, but it's also like, part of a problem because I looked at my blood sugar monitor and it was like over 200. Oh yeah. You know, it was really unhealthy, but once in a while, enjoy yourself, you know, just don't make it a daily habit to have your birthday cake every day. Like you don't need cake every day. It should be a, deca- a special occasion thing. Do you, re- do you, do you go as far as, are you as, as radical as someone such as myself saying, Oh, sugar is a drug. It should be 
you know, refer, it should be looked at the same way you consume any other drug or are you more yeah. lenient? I'm, 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 I'm going to say that sugar is a drug and so is most processed mm-hmm, foods mm-hmm, yeah. because they're designed to affect your brain like drugs do. Yeah. So why are we not treating them as, as such, you know, like, like they're, I mean, I get, I mean, I, I have to say like when I, when I was once dating this guy who, um, took me to these really nice Michelin restaurants mm-hmm. regularly. And there was a point after about six months of dating him where I was like, this is really fun, but I'm not, I don't feel good. <laughs> like I'm not feeling well after all this food. Yeah. And so I, I think the problem with like the whole, like saying sugar's a drug is like arguably every Michelin restaurant that I've been to, the food is drug like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's designed to be extraordinary on your, into your mouth. Like it's so, it hits so many different buttons that you're just like, it, it's, it's orgasmic. Right. But that are they, is food a drug? Well, I mean, food can be drug like, yeah. but, um, funny thing about my life is that having used like, I used to live in California and I used to eat like lots and lots of really fresh, delicious homemade food. And then I, then they hit the pandemic and I moved around a bit and I realized that it took me a lot more effort to get to eat the kind of food that I really liked. And I actually had to do some hunting and gathering. Like I wow. actually did some foraging and I like foraged for all sorts of things in the Midwest with my family. And I ate a lot, a lot of wild game that my, my dad shot because it was hard for me to find the kind of food that I wanted to eat. Yeah. It was actually a challenge. Um, and so I, I now when I cook, like I still cook to, to, to enjoy things, but I cook a lot simpler mm-hmm. and I'm really just focused on ingredients and I'm really, really like, yes, I, en- I do enjoy my food, but it's become so much more simple, the, the foods I cook now because I'm so busy. And I think most people, they treat food as though every single time they eat a special occasion mm-hmm. and every single meal they have has to be like the best meal of all time. And I look at food food as fuel now. It's yeah. like, yes, of course, I do enjoy going out to eat and I do enjoy eating healthy, delicious food. But I'm a lot less, I guess, I get, I guess I've kind of cut back a little bit on the excessive amounts of Epicureanism that I had yeah. years ago. And I'm, and, and when I see my family, I certainly indulge and like, I, I do enjoy like a good solid, like I do enjoy like, you know, <laughs> crab legs and, 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 uh, filet mignon. But I, I would say that most of what I eat these days is like pretty basic yeah. and it's like meat, vegetables, nuts, seeds, fruits. And it's a lot of stuff that I make myself. And I, I find that when I'm not overstimulating my own dopamine system, I don't have that hit every time I eat a meal where it's like, I need my next meal to hit me hard. Yeah. You know, like my food makes me feel good, but it's not stimulating my brain in a way that makes me feel high. Like it makes me feel just great. You know, yeah. I just feel, I like to feel good after I eat a meal. Um, and that I used to cook for, for, for bliss, you yeah. know, and for like extreme feelings of like, this is insane. Like during the pandemic, like I didn't have enough, I didn't feel like there was a lot of dopamine laying around because there was nothing to do. And so I was cooking to like hit my brain with like, boom, like this is like the best meal. And I was cooking Mm -hmm. these insane meals and then I was getting weight and I was getting fat and I was like, okay, I got to cut this out. So I've scaled back a lot of that and become a lot more um, simple. And I think simplicity and balance and harmony is really the secret to health. And that's, 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 that's where my life, my life has changed a lot in the last few years. I agree. You know, I, I'm, um, I'm, if, if you could ask me what my religion is, one of my religions are, um, are, uh, this, let's say decision fatigue, like the, uh, putting, uh, uh, sanctifying, uh, good decision making and distilling your, 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 or strengthening your decision making muscles, uh, in many different ways. I think that's a whole program someone should do sometimes. Obviously the book Atomic Habits is great to start with, but, oh, yeah. um, I think when you're when you're when you are investing all your whatever that is all your emotions and your and your energy into cooking food food it could be great it could be something that is a stress reliever for some people but for most of us it is actually Oh I do love to cook. Yeah. I mean don't get me wrong I love cooking I love baking and I love making things it's really nourishing. Yeah but I think for for, for going through that day in day out you are actually robbing other parts of your life that you could invest energy into uh, from that energy because you're in investing so much energy into cooking and you're deriving so much satisfaction from it where you, you know, you could diversify uh, the yeah. way you do that. Yeah, totally. 
Yeah. So just to kind of summarize um, what, what we were talking about here, and obviously um, that, you know, talking to you only made me, um, <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I can't wait for, for, for uh, the end of the month when the book comes out. So we were, yeah. we were talking about, you know, nutrition, uh, microbiome, uh, metabolic flexibility, hormone health, uh, you know, the future of biohacking, uh, tying it up to like mitochondrial health, uh, skin, you know, women's health, etc. cetera. Um, w- what do you say, like, what are your, what is the future of, of, of Molly Maluf looks like? Um, what is the next book going to be about? Or how do you Ooh. continue from here? Yeah, I mean, so my life is slowly, um, I don't know, like I, I started f- kind of feeling like I, I, I figured out a lot of metabolism Mm -hmm. and mitochondrial function. And I was like, this is cool. What's next? (laughs) And, um, I think what's really interesting is the role of relationships and human connection on health. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that I grew up thinking that love was like the Christian version of love. Like Jesus is unconditional love. And I, I I grew up in a really loving family. Mm -hmm. So I was really fortunate to have, um, you know, just, parents that were really unbelievably kind to me. But, um, over time, as I started dating and as an adult, I realized that like love is a really complex part of existence. And I think that we, um, don't really understand it. And we often don't realize the risks associated with it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that our company is doing is developing products and services around the science of love, Mm -hmm. but we're not treating love the same way that people treat it today. It's not like a Disney movie. It's not like a, it's not like a Spotify, you know, song that Mm -hmm. you're listening to. It's like love can be healthy or unhealthy and like unhealthy love. When people get broken up with, they can go crazy. They can lose their mind. They can, they can, you know, I, I'm personally dealing with, uh, a person who I had like a short term love affair who became obsessed with me and is now stalking me. And like, that's really scary. And women don't realize that love is dangerous in some cases. And like when we, when people lose family members and lose, lose love, they can go into deep grief and delayed grief and depression. So I really think that lack of love, like princess Diana once said is like the root cause of a lot of disease. And I would say over half of the DSM is related to lack of love, Mm -hmm. abuse and neglect of children. And, and so I, I'm really just like, I'm interested in creating a theory of health that's based on the science of how our bodies work. And to me, what's really interesting about mitochondria is that they're actually social organelles mm-hmm. and they're not just mitochondria. They're not just metabolic organelles. They actually behave like humans do. They, they come together, they fuse, they share information and resources. They, they break apart. Mm-hmm. They do all sorts of things that humans do. There's a great paper on this actually. And so I, I'm just convinced that like the biological imperative to survive and reproduce and connect is like, it's, it's, it's fundamental to understanding health and yet the connection piece has not made it into modern medicine or really the health world and the biohacking world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm really emphasizing is like human connection and, um, understanding how to create healthier relationships, how to have better conflict resolution, how to identify if a person might have a personality disorder and you shouldn't associate with them, Mm -hmm. um, to avoid getting hurt. If you break up with someone, how to actually, how to actually heal sexual dysfunction is a big piece of what I'm focusing on. Sexual trauma is a big cause of um, dis-ease in women and men. Yeah. And it's a huge underlinger of a lot of big problems in society. So we're focusing first on um, on creating a sex therapy. And then I'm very interested in the concept of measuring um, human connection through technology. So that'll be a later product we're going to build. Beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, Molly, I super appreciate the time that you uh, that you gave us. Uh, I, uh, as I keep keep saying, I can't wait to read the book. Uh, when is the book coming out? Uh, obviously, the name is Spark Factor. Brilliant sure. name. Ja- yeah, January thirty first mm-hmm. um, this month, and then you can buy it on Amazon on Barnes and Noble. You can go to my website www.drmolly.co backslash the Spark Factor. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram at drmolly.co. How about the audiobook? Uh, does it come out the same oh, time? Oh, I recorded it myself. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Highly recommended. It'll be, it'll be really fun to listen to, but I also would recommend getting it on 
uh, just getting the paperback form because it is it's it can be sometimes there are there are some parts of it that um you might want to read versus I agree listen to and I I agree when when it's a book that you want to really uh, like embed the information in your brain uh, no pun intended you really want to uh, sure. uh, I like listening to it then let's say listening to one chapter going back to the to the uh, physical version marking what I like there what I want to remember to me this is the best and most enjoyable way to, to experience a book so definitely that um, I highly highly recommend uh, consuming your also also your information uh, through social media thank you very much Molly uh, it's it's thank been you. a pleasure all right have a great day you as well bye bye Thank you.